right, let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 19. Luke 19, and uh, we're going to look at some, uh, some other verses just before that. But this will get us started. So we're looking at, uh, leading up to Easter, uh, eight days that changed the world. And so last Sunday, Jimmy Smith began our series. In that series, he took us to Sunday, before Jesus is going to be crucified on Friday, buried and raised from the dead the next Sunday. So this is the triumphant entry story. And here's what you get. A lot of people had heard about Jesus. A lot of people knew things about, a few things about Jesus. But there's still lots of questions. You know, is he just a good teacher? Is he a uh, revolutionary? Is he a troublemaker? Is he the promised one of God, the Messiah? And so this is, this is what's happening. A lot of speculation taking place. And the question is, who is Jesus, and what am I going to do about Jesus? And those questions still swirl around us every day. Everybody decides and it is deciding, what am I going to do with Jesus? What am I going to do with this story of the gospel, with this story of, this, of a Savior who has come? Now today, as we're taking these days one at a time, last Sunday we looked at the Sunday, this, today, this Sunday we're looking at Monday after the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, now, here's the thing about this. There are several challenges in doing this because the Gospels aren't strictly uh, chronological. They, they're intended for different audiences. There's a, you know, a Jewish audience and a Greek audience, a Roman audience, and different ways that they think, different things that are going to reach out to them. And so you have different pieces of the puzzle. So what we're trying to do this series is to tie all of these things together so that it it flows as far as what happened each day of the week. And there's plenty of uh, oh, Bible folks love to argue about such things. But uh, what Jimmy and I will be doing in the uh, next Sunday, uh, the whole senior staff is going to be up here doing something. It's quite the extravaganza next week. Uh, we're all preaching for five minutes except for maybe one or two of them. I can't count on all of them to, to hold that back. But uh, we're going to have uh, several of us speak. So what we're trying to do is... Uh, is present what took place on each of these days and some big lessons to learn. We're going to finish with Saturday and Sunday, uh, Silent Saturday, and then Sunday of Easter on Easter Sunday. Both of those is a, going to split the service in half, uh, a little darkness and then a whole lot of light. Now, to get started with this, uh, I want to start, before we get to Luke, I want to start with John 12. And John tells us this. Now, some Greeks were among those who went up to worship at the festival. And so they came to Philip. Well, why would Greeks come to Philip? Because Philip's a good Greek name. So this is one of the things about the gospel. You never know what it is about you that's going to be a connection point to somebody else. There's something about you that you're the first person somebody's going to talk to about Jesus. For Philip, just his name drew them in. Philip was from Bethsaida in Galilee and requested of him, Sir... My favorite sentence is in the Bible. Sir, we want to see Jesus. We just want to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. So these Greeks, they're God-fearers. And they had come to Jesus seeking something for spiritually starved souls. And the reason they're spiritually starved souls is because their, their cultural religion has failed them. Uh, their own land has failed them. The gods of the Greeks have failed them. And they come up wanting, and they're looking somewhere else. And so now they're trying, well, let's try the God of Abraham and Moses and the prophets. Let's try this God and see. And we find these kind of seekers coming to the temple. We have the story in Acts of the Ethiopian official who comes, and he's the same kind of guy. He's, his own religion, his own culture, his own country has failed him spiritually. And he is looking for something that is truth, something that is transcendent, something that is glorious and of God. Well, they've tried the God of uh, Abraham and Moses and the prophets and <clears throat> still spiritual famine. Now the Greeks, culturally, they are seeking people. They seek after truth. They seek after uh, new ideas. They're open to knowledge. And a lot of our American mindset culturally is tied to a Greek way of thinking about the world, a, a Greek worldview. 
So we do a lot of this in our own culture. We're seekers. We search for answers to questions. And even today, that's going to cause us, and you're in this building, you're going to catch it. People that we, in our visits out in the community, and we've been doing a lot of knocking on doors for the last couple of years, we found a lot of these spiritual conversations in play. People really want to see Jesus. And uh, when uh, Randy Bridges and I had a conversation, of, he was designing the stained glass window. I said, you know, really, in a simple way to do this, I, I, just, want, I just want a path that leads to the cross. Because life is a path, but at some point on that path, everybody's confronted with what am I going to do with Jesus? What am I going to do with the cross of Christ? What am I going to do with the Savior? And we're all going to come to that spot. So that's, that's, uh, that's what that symbol is about. May we see Jesus. Now, a lot of folks are looking for Jesus and uh, materialism, the it's all about me culture we live in. It's come up wanting for a lot of folks. And a lot of things that are just religious stuff for the sake of religious stuff, in whatever background somebody's coming from, uh, it, it leaves people feeling empty. And at some point, everybody gets to a spot to say, we wish to see Jesus. Okay, so how had these Greeks come to know about Jesus? Well, everybody's talking about him. He's the talk of the town. This is a big feast day. Everybody is, is, is excited about the feast day, but they're excited because they've heard stories about Jesus who heals the sick, Jesus who performs multiple miracles, Jesus who's this great teacher. And, and they're wondering, who is this Jesus? Now, that's at least one of the reasons why they're interested in Jesus. But there's another reason. As we compare these gospel accounts, that, uh, that passage we read earlier, from, uh, from John, a couple of verses. Here's what you get. Between verse 19 and 20, in my Bible, there's uh, a paragraph break, and there's some white space in there. Okay, so between here and here is Monday. And Monday is when Jesus cleansed the temple. And I think uh, this is a lot of the reason why these folks wanted to come to know Jesus. I want to read from Luke's Gospel, verse 41 of chapter 19. Luke 19, verse 41. Here's what God's Word says. As Jesus approached and he saw the city, this is on Monday. As Jesus approached and saw the city, he wept for it, saying, if you knew this day, what would bring peace? But now it's hidden from your eyes. For the days will come on you when your enemies will build a barricade around you, surround you, and hem you in on every side. They'll crush you and your children among you to, your children among you to the ground. They will not leave one stone on another in your midst because you did not this is a chilling verse. You did not recognize the time when God visited you. He went into the temple, verse 45, and began to throw out those who were selling. And he said, it is written, my house will be a house of prayer. And you've made it a den of thieves. Every day he was teaching in the temple. The chief priests, the scribes, the leaders of the people were looking for a way to kill him. But they could not find a way to do it because all the people were captivated by what they heard. Here is why they're interested in Jesus, because Jesus was interested in them. Because these uh, seekers, these Greeks, there's only one place that they could worship at the temple, and that area was a circus. Uh, there was so much crazy going on in that area, there's no way they or most of the Jewish people who'd spend most of their time in what is called the court of the Gentiles, they wouldn't be able to worship either. We compare these gospel accounts, and we learn from Mark. Let's start here. Is that, that first part of verse 41 of our, our thing, the, when we compare it with Mark, we find that Jesus 
when he uh, came in, the triumphant entry into Jerusalem and the palm fronds and we call Palm Sunday, when all those things were taking place, it says Jesus then made his way to the temple complex. And when he got to the temple, he uh, just looked around and he left. He left, he went back to Bethany. Bethany's on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. So he left, goes through the Kidron Valley, up the Mount of Olives, down the eastern side of the Mount of Olives. He's going to come to Bethany because he has some dear friends there. And at night, he's in the Jerusalem during, during the day during this week leading up to the cross. At night, he is uh, with friends and in a place of, uh, of love and grace and relationship. What he saw in the temple left him disappointed, angered, grieved, and he's going to address it on Monday. Now, Luke gives us another detail about that Monday. Jesus, he's on the eastern slope of the Mount of Olives. Those of you who've you've been to Israel, you've seen that iconic picture. You, you top the Mount of Olives, and that's your, your first view. You see Jerusalem, the old city of Jerusalem. You see... Uh, Oh, we'll go ahead and give us the next picture, I guess. Uh, well, I, well, I got a verse. That didn't help you at all. That's, that's on me. Uh, you top it, you see today the Temple Mount. Uh, you see the Dome of the Rock. You see all those things. Yes, yeah, that view. Thank you. Thank you, friends. Uh, and so that's what you see. And that was a time of great rejoicing. The Psalms of Ascents, there's a whole set of them in the teens and 20s of the Psalms. You look at that, Psalm 122, the first couple of verses says, I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. We, this was our devotional verse for the day uh, back in July when we got to Jerusalem and we were going to come over the top of the Mount of Olives, see that iconic view of the city. I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet were standing within your gates, Jerusalem. It was a celebration. That's, I'm excited. We have traveled to Jerusalem for one of the great feast days. There are three different feast days. All the men in Israel were supposed to attend worship at the temple in Jerusalem. This, is, this was the big one. And it's Passover. But Jesus didn't rejoice and sing uh, with the psalmist. He wept. He wept. And why is that? Because, I guess, as verse 44 in Luke 19 says, they did not recognize the time God visited them. He came, and they missed it. And a lot of people, so close, and they miss it. Now, that picture from Jesus' perspective, the Mount of Olives today, and uh, now, now we can go back to that, back to, thank you. Uh, so that's, that's roughly what you'll see today, uh, that view looking down on the Temple Mount. The next picture, though, is a picture of uh, what it looked like. There's the safety rail for your convenience. Because uh, in Jesus' day, they were way about safety. Now, this is actually a two-scale model of what... Uh, some, this is at the Israeli Museum in Jerusalem. And it's, uh, it's what they believe you would have seen, and this would have been the Mount of Olives view. You see the raised structure in the middle. That is actually the temple proper. The temple mount is all of that, uh, and uh, actually it went uh, extended out further than that in uh, Jesus' time. Jesus looks at the city, and he wept. Let me ask you this. Have you ever, I mean... And this is because of the lostness, the spiritual bankruptcy, the, the distortion of what is of God, God's word, God's truth, God, what it means to follow him. And Jesus wept. Have you ever wept? I mean, actually cried a tear over the, the lostness of your own family? Have you ever shed tears over the lostness of your neighborhood? You ever you ever just broken out and cried over the lostness of your city or the wayward spiritual nature of the nation or the lostness and hopelessness and brokenness in our world Jesus wept 
over his people, over his nation. And did, have you ever gotten to a spot where you were willing to sacrifice something to make that different? To, uh, to say, I'm going to give my time. I'm going to give my talents. I'm going to give my resources. I, I'm going to die to my comfort and my calendar enough that I am going to enter lostness and I'm going to care about what God cares about and I'm not going to be deterred from, from lifting up the name of Jesus. There are a lot of people who have not recognized that God in Jesus Christ has visited them. Now, when you look at that, that picture, the, the temple itself, the building itself, was not really that big. In fact, and I could give you a lot of numbers, but numbers don't help, so I'll give you some perspectives. Uh, the actual building, the, the temple complex proper, that thing that sits in the middle there that is different than the plaza around it, would fit in the infield of a, a baseball stadium. So that's the size we're talking about. It's not an enormous, enormous structure. <clears throat> And there wouldn't be a lot of people who could get in there at a time, especially during the big feast days when so many people were, were coming. But if you take the area around it, you're talking about staircases and plazas and porticos and uh, columns and all that stuff. Uh, built up by Herod the Great, by the way. Herod the Great was rotten in all kinds of ways, but he was an incredible builder, and he wanted to make the temple glorious. And at the time of Jesus, it wasn't finished until later, it, but it was mostly finished during Jesus' time. It was a glorious, imposing, wow, look at that kind of experience. People came just for the tourist attraction of it. People were drawn to it because something that grand, that glorious, maybe the God that's worshipped there is the God I should follow. And that's why so many people came. It's why the, the disciples, you know, they, they're walking along with Jesus, say, look at these massive stones. Look at this incredible architecture, this incredible structure, the glory of this place. It was an amazing place. <clears throat> so it's a large, imposing, imposing thing. Uh, the uh, Temple Mount itself. You know, today, you, know, you have uh, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, and you have the Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount. But there, there is all kinds of space up there. And it's basically the, not far from the outline of what uh, Herod created with the Temple Complex. Here's, uh, here's the thing about it. Herod wanted a place where all these people who were coming in, even for the feast days, he created it for the maximum capacity. And we know, because we know how, how many people during the great uh, Muslim feast days and celebrations, how many of them have been able to be on the mount at the same time, it'll accommodate about 250,000 people. So that, that's shoulder to shoulder, that's a crowd, but that's what Herod had created for this time, this was an amazing, amazingly large structure. Say so roughly, uh, we'd say 10 football fields of space. That temple, somewhere, and uh, again, we don't, we don't have pictures, we don't have uh, all the records, but that the height of it, that what Herod built, uh, 10 to 16 stories high, it stood out. It was, uh, it was an amazing bit of construction. What else archaeologists have found is that there are about 50 ritual baths. These are large, uh, large areas where you had to be ritually cleansed. And it was part of representing your spiritual cleansing and preparation to go into this special place of worship. So the Jewish men, they'd pass through these ritual baths. And we've uncovered a lot of them. And you go through the bath and then you put on your white robe and now you're ready to go into the temple complex. Because you don't enter into the presence of God lightly. And th that, that theme comes over and over and over again uh, right at us. You don't enter into worship lightly, casually, uh, carelessly. Well, they're going to have go through the ritual baths. They're going to be outwardly clean as they are preparing their hearts spiritually. Then uh, Bible scholars give us the southern steps. These were unearthed uh, years ago now. The southern steps on the southern entrance, and archaeologists believe this is where the poor people came into the temple complex. Uh, everybody didn't enter anywhere they wanted to. If you went to enter the temple complex, poor people came through here. The southern steps are really an interesting spot. If you look uh, up at the top of the steps, you see where it 
doesn't seem to match. You see lots of some different color, and then it's just solid. That's because that entrance has been bricked up. Because now, if you if you uh, if you came up at that spot, you'd come up underneath the Al-Aqsa ma- uh, Mosque, and so that's why it is walled up. Uh, because that's the the mosque is right up on top of that wall, that corner of the of the uh, temple complex. What's amazing about the steps? You know, steps for safety, they're, they're uniform, so you know what to expect. So you, you, you go down your steps, you know what to expect. Uh, going up, you, it's simple, and you can just trot up your steps, and you're all, you're all set. And a uh, safety thing, that's why we do steps the way we do steps. And there's certain length, it's a normal step, and so that keeps you people safe. And blah. Well, these steps, and by the way, some of these have been restored. And you get there, you can see these have been restored many of them are original. It's not often when you're in Israel that you say, Jesus actually walked up these steps, that you step where Jesus stepped. This is one of those precious places. But here's the thing about the, the, the southern steps. There'll be one step that is this wide, and the next step is this wide. And so not only are you not just step, 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 you take a step, and then you can't even you're not going to step like that. You have to take a half step and then take the next step. The idea is you're entering into the worship of Almighty God. You're about to go into the temple. You need to think about every step you're taking. You do not take these steps lightly, carelessly, casually, thoughtlessly. You want to be careful about your steps as you're stepping toward the Lord. And so you have the ritual baths. You have the steps leading up. And, and here's what happens. When you get to the top of the steps... You, uh, you're coming up underneath that big platform and you emerge from below onto the Temple Mount. And when you come up from the southern steps, there is laid out this glorious, beautiful, amazing, and holy uh, temple. And Jesus, when he came up those steps and emerged onto the temple platform, he is offended by everything he sees. And he is angry about everything he sees. And that results in the cleansing of the temple. He is on the he's in what is called the court of the Gentiles when he comes out. That's where most of the people, Jews and Gentiles, are going to be for most of the time they're on the Temple Mount. Because again, the temple itself is very small. So this is where he's coming out, and he is offended by what he sees in the court of the Gentiles. And so uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about why he was offended. And to do that, I need to give you a little bit of perspective. And so we have some volunteers that we actually recruited and manipulated and threatened. And they're going to help us uh, by uh, suiting up. So when you look at the temple complex, so some of you have seen these charts before. <coughs> there, are, there are layers of access. So the, the first area that you run into, by the way, so the temple, the temple itself... When you enter the, that thing that the, was in the, more the middle of uh, the Temple Mount, you enter through the gate called Beautiful. So in Acts 3, there's a story about Peter and John, and they come to the gate called Beautiful, and there's a guy there. He's, he's, uh, he can't walk, and you get that. Uh, he, he's thinking they're going to give him something, that Peter and John are going to give him something. Silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Stand up and walk. And he went into the temple with him. That was at the gate called Beautiful. So that's the, that's the entrance. And the first thing you get to once you get through the gate is the court of the women. So we need some women to be in our court. So if y'all can position yourselves here because, you know, it's, it's, a, real, it's a real guys club. So women are out here. Now, but the thing about the court of the women is... The court of the women is the largest of the courts because a lot of people are going to be in there for any number of reasons. So the court of the women, that's as far as a Jewish woman could go. Now, Gentiles weren't supposed to go in the, in the temple complex, the, the temple proper. They're out in the courtyard, the court of the Gentiles. But the women, they're in the court of the women. In the court of the women, there are several things. This is a place where they can go to worship. A lot of men are going to spend most of their time, if they're in the temple, in that spot. We see Jesus multiple times in the court of the women. Here's some of the things going on in the court of the women. There's some outbuildings, some uh, areas where some special things are happening. 
you've heard of the Nazarite vow. We find it in the Old Testament. It's a special vow to the Lord. It's a temporary thing for a specific purpose. And the Nazarite vow, there's a building there that that the Nazarite can begin the vow there or end the vow there. You know, the, remember Samson had Nazarite vow, didn't cut his hair. At the end of the vow, a person could come and have their hair cut, go through a process. There was a building for that. There was a building where they stored firewood because all those sacrifices required a lot of firewood. So there was a place where they had the firewood stored. There was a place, by the way, see these priests, they, they rotated who was uh, serving in the temple. One of the places, if you read your Old Testament, you get into, especially Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and you'll find, you'll hit one of those places in your reading where it says, laws about skin diseases. You go, you know what, I'm kind of I'm kind of glad that we do church the way we do it now, because uh, I'd let Jimmy be in charge of skin diseases. Um, I, I think that uh, I'd just refer to you to a good dermatologist. But there was a place where if someone had leprosy, they'd been cured of leprosy. Remember, Jesus cured some people and said, go show yourself to the priest. They went to the temple, to that spot in the court of the women, and they would say, yeah, you're completely cleansed. You can go back into society, back to your family, back to your neighborhood, and you've been restored. So that's, that's one of the places that's there. Then uh, you have a wine and oil chamber. It's a, that's a part of the ongoing things that were happening in the temple's use, and so... There was a place to store those things. There are also 13 trumpet-shaped receptacles that were for offerings in the court of the women. You remember the story where it says Jesus was, was sitting in the temple watching people give their offerings. And he saw a woman who gave two mites. He said she's given more than anybody else because they gave out of their plenty. She's given out of her poverty. Jesus was sitting in the court of the women when he saw the widow give her mites to the Lord. And uh, so this is, there's a lot of things going on in the court of the women. Now, uh, we're going to move to the next layer of this. And now we need our hall of Israel where the Israelite men would come. Thank you, gentlemen. There we go. Don't they look Israelite manly? Okay, so these folks, they could come... And there's really a, probably a small wall between the court of the women and their court. They're just there waiting for their sacrifices to, to be taken care of and returned to them. You know, a lot of the sacrifices are burnt offering. They return part of the sacrifice to the person who's offered it. So that's, that's the court of the men, the court of the hall of Israel, it's called. And uh, from there, you go three steps up. And from, that, from those steps, the priest interacted with people there, prayed for people there, blessed the people from there. But those three steps up led to the court of the priests. So I need some priestly types. And look how priestly these guys are. Uh, you guys are lovely. I appreciate that. Yeah, so this is the uh, court of the priests. And that's where those sacrifices are offered. They're prepared, sacrificed, uh, this is a big job for the priests, especially during the feast days. Because remember, the feast days, there'd be thousands of people. And so there's always, a, there's usually a morning and evening sacrifice during the course of the year. But on the big feast days, especially Passover, there'd be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of sacrifices. So these guys, this, go back to your Old Testament again, where it's described, and Moses says, this is how you should do it. They're, they're slinging a lot of blood in that place. They're, they're slaughtering animals for the sacrifices. During the big feast days, they found that there was uh, actually drainage pipes because it was so much blood, they had to get rid of it somehow, and they drained it out into the Kidron Valley, the, the brook of Kidron, and it would run uh, pretty deep and red with blood. So this is where all that's happening. The priest had that big responsibility. Then uh, we move on, and we get into the temple proper, the main, uh, main areas, the holy place and the holy of holies. So now the holy place, there's a seven-branch candlestick. There's a golden altar where they'd burn incense. There's a table, the bread of presence. You hear those stories. You read in the Old Testament. They're carrying it over from the tabernacle to the temple. And all that's taking place in the holy place. And then finally, you get to the innermost part of the temple, the holy of holies. It's originally constructed by Solomon. When Solomon constructed it, the Ark of the Covenant uh, is, is in the Holy of Holies. 
But shortly after Solomon's death, uh, there are several different theories about what happened next. Raiders of the Lost Ark has one of those theories in that movie of what happened to the, to the Ark of the Covenant. But it's gone at that point. And so right now, there is nothing in the Holy of Holies except it's still the set-apart place. And there is this large, thick curtain that separates the Holy of Holies off. And so our high priest back there in his high priestly outfit, this is actually pretty close to what it's supposed to look like. Uh, our high priest, he could enter the Holy of Holies on one day a year, on the Day of Atonement, to pray and uh, ask forgiveness for the sins of the nation. And so this, uh, this gives us this picture. So really, in the temple proper, court of the women, the... Uh, Hall of, Hall of Israel, court, court for, of uh, Jewish men, not a very big area there. Court of the priests, then the holy place, then the holy of holies. And everything else was the court of the Gentiles. So all of you guys, you represent the court of the Gentiles, except it would have gone on and on and on. There was a lot of space because that's where most people were going to be. When Jesus did most of his teaching in the temple, he was in the area that was known as the court of the Gentiles when he was doing his teaching. And... So here are these people in the area where most of the people were going to be most of the time was completely secularized. And trying to worship there, pray there, hear from God there, especially on the feast day, was about like trying to have your quiet time in the center lane of North Central Expressway at 7 o'clock in the morning on a Monday. It was just going to be really hard. You're going to be squeezed out from the things of God. And Jesus said, enough is enough and I want to explain to you what was happening in the court of the Gentiles to my one lovely actors thank you so much for your participation to please express your appreciation of these folks for playing along and we chose people who really enjoy dressing up in costumes so that's you can see how much it, it uh, blessed their hearts to be a part of that <clears throat> now here's what you have in the court of the Gentiles you have money changers Remember, Jesus turned over the tables of the money changers, the Bible says. Here's what the money changers were doing. If you, for all, for all Jewish, Jewish men coming to the temple to worship, you had to pay the, the temple tax when you came. It had to be paid in the shekel of the temple. It was a special coinage, and that was all it was used for, was the temple tax. So if you're coming to Jerusalem for one of the feast days, one of the three big feast days, especially Passover, you... Uh, you could get a hotel room. You could get a place to stay. You could use Phoenician coins, Egyptian coins, Greek coins, Roman coins. But if you're going to pay your temple tax, you had to have the temple of the treasury. Well, most people weren't going to be hauling that around. So they had to exchange money. Now, it probably began as a convenience early on, but somewhere along the way it became a money-making scheme. We know that the high priestly family, Annas, Caiaphas, and a whole series of brothers, they... They controlled the high priesthood during Jesus' time, and those guys were incredibly wealthy. We have records that the Romans were borrowing money from them. Okay, how did the high priest family become so wealthy? They became so wealthy because they were sticking it to the people on things like the temple tax. So what they would do, you come in and go, well, let's see, I, got some, uh, I have some uh, Roman coins. Okay, well, you need to exchange that for the temple tax. Well, there's an exchange fee. Okay, well, I got to do it, so they pay the exchange fee. Oh, you didn't have exact change? There's another fee for that. Most everybody was paying both fees, and people who were coming to worship the Lord, <clears throat> come to do what God said to do, are being taken advantage of. In the court of the Gentiles, animal sacrifices are a big part of what's taking place. It's just a reminder of the, of the depth of sin. Again, if you read it in the Old Testament, you're going to see these examples where a family brings their animal and they lay their hands on it. Sometimes you see priests laying their... I just read the, the section in Numbers where the priests are... Uh, the priestly family, Aaron and his sons, are being dedicated to the Lord. And it says, tell them to place their hands on the animal. They cut the animal's throat and it would die. And they would feel there is a price to be paid for sin. The wages of sin is death. And it was a tangible expression of that. So these animal sacrifices are taking place. These folks would bring their animals from home. Okay, I've got my show lamb, uh, good for the stock show, good for the temple. 
It's a great shape. It's a beautiful animal. Bring my lamb. Bring my calf. Bring for the poor uh, uh, pigeons or uh, doves. We find Mary and Joseph when they dedicated Jesus. That's what they brought because they were among the poor people. You bring your sacrifices to the temple and the priest would have to evaluate it. Last week in my Bible reading, I read the book of Malachi. Malachi is a book on worship in the Old Testament. Last book in the Old Testament. It's a great study of what worship is. Malachi goes after the people in, in that time, what, 4th century B.C., and he says, you, you're bringing your sick and your lame and your, your, your disease. You, you're, bringing, you're bringing your junk to God, animals that you don't want anymore. You're supposed to bring your best. It's supposed to be an unblemished animal, the perfect animal. So they'd have to come with their animal from home, be a great animal. And the priest would have to inspect it. And the priest routinely said, doesn't quite pass uh, inspection. This, this animal has some flaws. I wish you could. I tell you what, you came all this way. We'll do you a favor. We have some temple approved animals over here in this pen. We'd be glad to trade out your inferior animal for one of our temple approved animals. You pay, you pay for the difference because, I mean, ours are obviously better and approved. And so the people, well, you know, what, what else am I going to do? I can't argue with the priest over this. I can't, this isn't up for negotiation. So they bring their animal and pay their fee. Again, that goes into the pocket of the high priestly family. And then they, and I, we'll, we'll take your animal off your hands. I mean, you've traded it in. You've paid the fee. And they take, we've, we, historical record says it was routine. They would take the inferior animal, put it back in the same pen, and later in the day, they'd sell it to somebody else as one of the approved animals. And it's just a scam going on. And it's a circus. And all this is taking place in all these areas that are dedicated to the worship of God for most of the Jewish people and all of the Gentile people who would come to this place to worship. It's just a conspiracy. And this is just traffic. So Mark's gospel tells us that Jesus wasn't allowing anyone to carry goods through the temple. So that's one of the things that happened on the cleansing of the temple. He said, you can't just be hauling stuff through here. And what that was about is the temple complex, because it's right there on the edge, the eastern edge of Jerusalem. You're going into the Kidron Valley. You're going up to the east to the Mount of Olives. Over the top of Mount of Olives, a whole series of villages. Lots going on on the Mount of Olives. And people just said, you know, I could go the long way around this big old temple complex, or I could just cut through the court of the Gentiles, and I'm just about there. And so they were using the temple as a shortcut to get to the eastern side of uh, Jerusalem and on to the Mount of Olives. And where people were, were wanting to pray, focus on God, hear from God, experience God, they were in the middle of a highway. And Jesus said, this cannot be. And so all this just enraged Jesus. And he saw these pilgrims coming to the Passover And he just couldn't allow this foolishness to continue. People were seeking God, and they were being kept from worshiping the one true God. And the, the other part that was that, that's sad about the whole story is the people that were entrusted with caring for this temple, they, they had lost a sense of the presence of God. Not only were they inc not encouraging others into a spiritual encounter with Almighty God, Creator, Redeemer, Friend, but they're keeping them from it. They didn't expect to meet God. They didn't desire to meet God. So they were just doing the religious stuff. You know, check the religious box. Okay, came to the temple, brought my sacrifice, paid my fees, all done, I'm good till next time. For a lot of people, uh, worship is just checking the box. Took care of that, did that, didn't expect anything, didn't desire anything from God. You know, religious consumerism in this case was a driving force. And not to, it's a sad part, it was not, I'm going to love the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. That wasn't anybody's radar. It was all, all the lesser things. And Jesus said, this cannot be. So here's my concern. And this is in your program in the introduction. Uh, when, when you think about worship, Loving the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. A lot of you, like me, you've been going to church for a long time. You've been showing up and doing your thing. 
But it's so easy to get to a spot where we're just yawning at the things of God. At the presence and power and glory of Almighty God, we just, eh, whatever. You know, when you think about your relationship to God, is, is that relationship, and this can happen in a, in a long run, it can happen in a season of life where a relationship to God just becomes something that's casual, comfortable, convenient, maybe just an opportunity to practice criticism, carelessness. This event, according to Luke, according to the Gospels as a whole, this is the catalyst that led Jesus' enemies to say, we are going to kill him. And Jesus knew that everything he did on Monday of that holy week was going to lead to the cross. So, that concludes the introduction to the sermon. And now, here is the sermon. One sentence. Jesus did not die on the cross for casual Christianity.